Hello, this is Lewis Lovehog recording a commentary track for the Superman 4 review. Now, before we get into the review itself, I think I should uh, talk about the tortured history of this review, and actually why both Doug and I refer to this as a cursed video. Uh, the thing is, I first proposed this review back uh, last April when we were first planning out the brawl. Uh, he was okay with the idea of doing the review together. The uh, problem was that he didn't think we'd have enough time to do it since he had to film the nerd review. And I said, well, that's all right. We can, we can at least give it a shot. I mean, I'll write out a script. I'll send it to you. If you don't like it, then that's fine. And he was okay with that. And I sent him out a script. He, loved, he liked it. We were... We, decided, we realized that we would not have enough time to actually film the review itself, but we decided to film the introduction of it together. And we actually filmed in uh, my hotel room and did it in front of a green screen. And we had this bit where, again, I would be wearing the Nostalgia Critic's outfit, his actual outfit, and it would be like I was inside of his house, I had sold his desk and his chair, and, uh, of course, he'd be naturally angry. And... It looked like crap, but it was what we were willing to work with, at least at first. But then we realized, well, we're going to bring me back. We're going to bring Spoonie and I up uh, in August for the Alone in the Dark review. Uh, though that was much later. He, he, he accidentally kept postponing the review, not realizing it. But anyway, the point being, we had something in mind. We would record the actual review together in the actual Nostalgia Critic room in August when we did after we did the uh, Alone in the Dark review. The problem was, as you're probably aware with the Alone in the Dark review, Doug lost his voice and there was no way he could do a full-on Nostalgia Critic review like that. Uh, so we decided, well, we'll do the original plan. We'll just film the introduction and the rest of the review we'll do from alternate places. And we recorded it. It was beautiful. It was funny. Uh, there was a bit with Spoonie popping up under the desk, too, asking if he should leave, too. And then Doug promptly um, lost the footage. Well, to be accurate, he had a copy on his hard drive, the file got corrupted, couldn't use it, and it turned out he had accidentally taped over the tape of it. Which, you know, we were sad about, but, well, whatever. There's nothing we can do about that. So he then planned on putting it on uh, using the original intro introduction sequence again. And it looked terrible. He really didn't want to use it, so he asked me just to film the short introduction sequence. This is like what we had there. But then... <laughs> We had some complications there, too. When I was filming my sequences, I actually... My, my camera was out of focus, so I filmed my entire review, my part of the review, in a blur. <laughs> so I had to re-record that, and he had problems with the files I had sent him because I use HD files, ABCHD.MTS kind of files. And uh, and eventually he was able to get it to work, though if you notice in the actual video that uh, there was a whole bunch of uh, uh, skipping, kind of shakiness at points, and yeah, a little blurry at times. But eventually we got it all sorted out and we got the review itself out there, and we were really proud of it and really happy just because we'd beaten the cursed review. We were not going to let this review beat us. Especially not Superman 4. Of, of all the... Vi of all the movies, Superman 4 is watchable, it's it's awful, but it's certainly not along the lines of, say, Garbage Pail Kids. The movie is really disappointing, too. I mean, we finally have a, se have a movie where we can have a full-on brawl between two super-powered beings, and it's just... just so disappointing. <laughs> Then there's the Daily Planet being bought out subplot, which is the only thing one that actually has resolution. We see the paper being progressively taken over and all that stuff. Oh yeah, the uh, Fox News, but I should get into into some of the, com the the political commentary. First of all, for all the people who uh, sent negative reactions to Doug about the political aspects of it, I wrote those. So if you have anyone you want to yell at, you, you send them to me. With the exception of that Fox News joke we just saw a minute ago. That was all him. 
but the point being, he didn't write it. I did. I tend to include more political stuff in my reviews. I it, it's always on the fence about whether or not I should do it or not. But I always try to make it at least for laughs. The president here is completely unconvincing. He looks like he's like glancing down at a script right in front of him. And the Jeremy subplot, which is, which goes even more nowhere if that was even possible. And tell me something: what exactly is the point of having of asking a whole bunch of grade schoolers what they would do about the crisis? As uh, I think, I think Jabutu's review of Superman Four pretty much put it best. You know, if if kids were the were supposed were so damn smart about figuring this stuff out, why aren't they the ones in charge? Really should have done more to make fun of Jeremy's voice because it's just like what the hell? It's obviously dubbed over, but they dubbed it over in the most ludicrous way possible. Superman, he would come to us. I love Jeremy's plan, too. Send a, a letter to Lois Lane and then have her deliver it to Superman. <laughs> because, of course, Lois Lane, you know, go, gets into danger every five seconds. And the Elders of Krypton sequence. This, this is really something that doesn't make any sense. First of all, the Fortress of Solitude blow, blew up in, in Superman 2. Okay, maybe that was a cutscene, but still. And what exactly is the point of these elders of Krypton? They say, you know, they're going to befall the same fate as as Krypton? Well, they're not going to... Krypton fell because of a natural disaster, not a nuclear disaster. I guess it's just the fate is going to be the same. They're both going to die. But how much did Jor-El really pack into that stupid little crystal anyway? Oh, I have your mother, and I have myself, and here are the elders of Krypton who didn't believe us when we said we were go the whole universe, our planet was going to die. The flying sequences. I, I really just saw this movie for the first time. This seems awfully familiar. It's like, oh my god, it's the exact same flying sequence, except really done in a ter terrible budget. Uh, one bit that didn't make it from the script to the actual video was a bit where we're both supposed to run in front of a green screen and uh, kind of in a Flintstones kind of a thing where we're like running in front of the same background over and over. And the magic memory erasing kiss. What was the point? He, he revealed his identity to her and then just took it away again. So the UN scene. Oh my God, is that entirely conveyed in the actual footage we say? But one of the other things that Superman says is, "I will do what our governments have been unable or unwilling to do." Yet clearly, they're perfectly willing to give up their nuclear weapons. And I think it would have actually made for a better movie if we saw him like having to forcibly try to remove the nuclear weapons. But of course, in this movie's bizarre take on reality, you can't do that. All everyone, Every rational person wants to get rid of nuclear weapons, because nuclear weapons are the source of all strife and conflict. It, it's really a naive outlook, and again, we're getting into the politics discussion. Now, another thing we got bashed on for this was the Israel thing, and I should point out that at no point during this video do we say Israel is good or Israel is bad. We're simply saying that Israel would not be so happy about this, okay? Again, the, the discussion of it is international politics. In real life politics, countries are looking out for their best interests and not everyone is going to get along with all this. Another cut, scene, cut thing that actually uh, I'm kind of sad didn't make it out because it further pointed out the illogic of, of, this, of the, uh, of the uh, nuclear weapons taking. That Superman is technically an American symbol and yet the Soviet Union is perfectly willing to adhere to the to the tyrannical uh, uh, dictates of this American symbol, saying, "Hi, I'm going to take your nuclear weapons," and even even though you know I don't work, I don't. Oh, yes, he technically works for the entire world, but he's based in America. Most of the problems seem to face he faces in America. What would you, if you were the Soviet Union? What would you think? 
So I am glad this bit made it into the actual review. There was another bit later on that uh, that we sadly, uh, for time, uh, we had to cut, which was where uh, uh, for Lois's interview with Superman, she was given a list of questions to be asked by her e- by the evil Rupert Murdoch stand-in, we, and one of, and a lot of those and one of those questions was. Uh, Oh, are you? Is this secretly a plot to undermine our national defense? Which is, which admittedly is a silly question when everyone's giving up their nuclear weapons. But at the same time, it it, it is a pretty legitimate question when you think about it, especially with, especially when Superman makes such a statement that he's going to take away the nuclear weapons. Uh, but yeah, that bit was cut for time. We we actually, and also we uh, included, we did a fake list of questions like uh, like uh, are you going to to try to help stop countries where genocide is being committed, or is your your plan for world peace only about nuclear weapons? Because you know, there's there's uh, so much horror and terrible things in the world, and yet the only thing, the only thing he's fixated on is nuclear weapons, as if this is going to solve all the world's problems. What about hunger? What about genocide and death camps? What about all the the, the sheer awful things in the world? And Again, comic books have dealt into this subject before, for good or for bad. And in fact, it's become some, something of a cliche these days that, you know, oh, the superpower being can't interfere. It just doesn't work. But at the same time, yes, it's a cliche, but it could still be really well executed, especially in a movie form. This movie had so much potential, and it's just squandered for dumb bits like the Lenny Luther stuff, who apparently was meant to appeal to a younger audience. Yeah, John Cryer, the representation of our generation, ladies and gentlemen. And again, the single strand of Superman's hair, which, by the way, this plan is already flawed as it is, because a single strand of hair, the only, the place where the genetic material is stored is at the very end of the hair, where it would meet the scalp. So I'm guessing the hair probably doesn't even have that. It's really hard to find one of those anyway. And again, cuts the the super strong thing with a hedge clipper. Other people have pointed out that actually a 1,000-pound ball like that would be really thick and cause a lot more damage. And the think tank. Oh, sorry, not the think tank. Uh, this one of these guys is part of a nuclear think tank, uh, and that is why. And that was why he was included. Also, the French arms dealer. And the oh, shut those blinds! I'm so transparently evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these characters serve no purpose other than to be represent representatives of what Christopher Reeves thought to be evil people at the time, like Republicans, think tanks, uh, weapons dealers, and the mad Russian. Uh, I'm not sure what he was trying to prove with a lot of that. And a, a somewhat funny bit here or, uh, with uh, Gene Hackman uh, saying that his... Uh, Actually, I can't remember what the bit was. I think it actually had to do with the soldier he was talking to. There are there are some minorly humorous bits in all this. Oh, like uh, like uh, like you get your standard missile countdown, and they start counting down, and Luther's just like eh, reaches over, p- pushes the button, <laughs> and Nuclear Man is born. And dear Lord, is he silly! This actor, this is apparently his only role, and he doesn't even get to really speak. <laughs> See this bit right here with the with the nails. I never thought that would actually work, and yet it actually does work work with Doug's editing. So kudos to him for that. And no, these effects aren't like mine because, well, these effects are better than mine. <laughs> and the comedy of having Clark Kent act like an idiot. Yeah, we have the impending nuclear war, but no, we have to delve into some comedy and sports to real and exercise to really, really date this movie. And this bit right here, uh, Doug was the one who, who put in the music. I didn't, I didn't write anything in the original script. I should note a lot of this was my original script, but Doug, uh, since it's his show, he made a lot of alterations to it, and I'm so thankful for that because I think there were a lot of dead bits in my original script that really just didn't work as well. And of course, Doug is a master of comedy and himself, and the music here is just, it's just wonderful for this little sequence. <laughs> And 
And as many people have pointed out that it is not a Victorian dress, it's a Georgian period dress. Well, okay, you're right, but I am not histor an historical fashion expert. I'm sorry, I, I, I see old-timey clothes and I thought Victorian. It doesn't... I, I don't make any any defense other than I'm sorry I screwed up and you're right I'm sorry uh, also the big lipped alligator bit moment uh, that was another thing that sadly didn't work out quite as well because in the original script uh, we were both in the same room together and he does the big lipped alligator moment I'm glancing around everyone like what, what the hell was that are there demons in your house or something Still, it was funny, I think, how he, how he pulled it out. I don't know, the nostalgia chick thought it up. Inconsistency. How the hell does he know where, where, how the hell does Gene Hackman know where Clark Kent is? He's, he's, yeah, I can summon you here, and it's only on a signal you can hear, but here, the TV set. <laughs> the roar. Love that. Gene Hackman trying to do a roar. Just imagine that. It's like it's trying to see a serious actor. The guy has been in some of the best movies ever. People have said that there's never... Gene Hackman never does a bad performance anywhere. And, and you got to think to yourself, well, then there was that time he roared in Superman 4. Oh, the music from Super Mario Brothers 3, that was brilliant. I, I would have never thought of that, but that is just so perfect. I kind of question the physics of plugging the volcano like this. I'm not sure how that would actually work out in real life. Hey, Motobele, we're so Italian. And the Great Wall of China. <laughs> Using the wall repair vision. I've heard that actually the original idea was to uh, actually have him moving at super speed to try to fix everything up. But for budgetary reasons, they couldn't do it, which doesn't make much sense. All you'd have to do was a, like a red and blue blur. And the Statue of Liberty carrying. I wonder if they actually made like a huge mock-up of the Statue of Liberty's ham, hand to... Uh, to carry out, which reminds me, the, the the cape flapping thing from earlier, people have have told me that, you know, yeah, it's just like, of course a cape can move in the vacuum of space, it just, but the thing is, there's a difference between stuff like, like the Apollo moon landing and the flag there and what we're seeing here. The flag in the Apollo moon landing, they dug it into the ground and they twisted it around, causing a wave effect when uh, the flag ripples like that. In this, uh, Superman's cape, if he was, if it was really flapping, it should have been flowing behind him. But we clearly see the cape flapping to the side as if in a wind tunnel. And again, that roar. Roar. <laughs> Stop! Don't hurt the people! I'll just stand here and be completely ineffectual! Look out! He's going nuclear! <laughs> oh, what? Like, the humor in this is really that much better. Kaboom! Stop! Don't do it! The people! Don't make me yell at you some more! I love it. Superman just stands there. They obviously don't have the budget to actually do any kind of real damage, uh, any real fighting, so they just kind of stand there. In the original uh, cut of the film, there was actually a first nuclear man who more closely resembled the Superman villain Bizarro, kind of the inverse Superman, uh, who was basically like a mentally challenged version who who would say like stuff like, "Me, me, Bizarro, not like this." When actually he meant he liked stuff, he would always speak in opposites. It was really weird and stuff like that. But at the same time, it was really just a silly thing for the first nuclear man. You couldn't take him seriously. He was destroyed or electrocuted or something. And then Luthor used that genetic material to make the new nuclear man. The one we have here. Which I think is a bit of an improvement, even if he looks very silly. 
And oh my god, flying through space, this is just, wow. I mean, you could even forgive the Superman talking in space, even briefly, because, you know, Superman, he can do any, he, he develops powers every second. But this is a regular human here, and wow, that's just... I, I, I think in the original script I also included one of my bits, which was, Of course, don't you know anything about science? Probably would have just taken us out of the whole thing. There's that shot again of Superman flying at the camera. Bring Lacey back down to Earth, she'd probably burn up in the atmosphere. And, and dropping the nuclear man into the nuclear power plant. Not only should that super... Ch and in a... Bizarre, and let's let's point out the fact that Superman just killed somebody. Yes, he was an evil nuclear menace, but this is Superman we're talking about here. He killed somebody. He killed a villain. Oh, gotta love this. The UN only has three microphones. Yeah, big worldwide teleconference, but just the three microphones. Apparently, it was a, it was a there was something else more important to the news that day. And yeah, Asin pointed out that this is actually supposed to be like a real speech that was given about peace. But that just, under, just underlines just the utter stupidity of this even more. That it had to try to take material from other people in order to try to sound like actually dignified and good. And at the same time, it, it just... Yeah, it just makes it more sucky. <laughs> Because, first of all, you're taking a speech out of, of its regular context, context and trying to apply it to this bizarre fantasy situation. And the back credit card bit. I, I've talked to Doug about this. I'm kind of disappointed that we didn't have, like, a pause of me saying uh, uh, before I said back credit card. Because I wanted to seem like I'm thinking for a second, okay, what can I do to drive him insane? Bad credit card! And that's... and. Yeah, the length of why this took so long for the whole thing to get out is why it says special thanks to me for being so patient. I was losing my voice because I had recorded this. Th this is like my third video recording. I recorded one of my Silent Hill reviews at the same time while doing this, so my throat was really dying out at this point. But anyway, uh, that's Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. So thank you and good night. And hopefully this has illuminated more about the whole process and... Hopefully you were entertained.